Thank you, Chris. My name is Ruprecht van Butler. I have the pleasure to help with the programs here at uh, the MIT NFI Press Forum San Diego. And one of the things that we decided to do a while back is uh, talk about moonshots, uh, things that uh, uh, affect uh, our human lives and uh, solutions that can really lead to a breakthrough in uh, solving problems. In the past, uh, we had um, a speaker on um, uh, a microbiome, uh, curing skin diseases. Uh, we had a speaker on uh, how to use uh, bioengineered lagoons to clean up water and things like that. Tonight, uh, I think we are talking about a much more serious um, uh, problem to solve, which is Alzheimer's disease, which I can only imagine is one of the most horrible things that uh, a partner of somebody who ha has a partner with Alzheimer's disease might face. So it's my pleasure to introduce Nas Duji. I've uh, worked with Dr. Duji for, oh my God, a long time. I've known her even longer than that. And uh, I know that she is going to be able to take you through the background of this disease and uh, how the new approach that Center Biosciences has taken is hopefully going to lead to a breakthrough moonshot solution. Nas Duji. Thanks. <laughs> OK. Well, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Ruprecht, uh, for the kind introduction. And thank you to the organizers for, in, for this invitation to speak. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Let's just get started. So um, I'm here from Center Biosciences. Um, a, a brief introduction on the company. Center Biosciences is a privately held biopharmaceutical company that I founded along with John Singer, uh, my friend and uh, colleague of many years who unfortunately passed away last year. Um, and this company was founded uh, to discover and develop new novel drugs for the prevention and treatment of Alzheimer's disease. We are currently at preclinical stage, and we are hoping to file for an IND later on this year. Senna has a novel and different uh, patented, proprietary patented technology that arrests the underlying cause of the disease, and that is the formation and accu accumulation of A-beta in the brains of patients. Uh, I will be talking at great length about that. Uh, and all the IP that's been developed by myself and uh, John Singer, uh, it was first, we first uh, filed our first patents from UCSD. Uh, Senna has exclusive license of all the technology, and of course all the later patents uh, are Senna, Senna patents. Uh, we have been funded almost entirely by the NIH and a little bit of money from uh, the founders. So, you know, one of the most frequent questions I, ask, I get asked is, what is the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Well, the answer is, Alzheimer's disease makes up between 50 and 80% of all dementia cases, where dementia is just a general term uh, for memory loss, loss and other intellectual abilities that are serious enough to interfere with daily life. So if you look at that pie, you know, there are other dementias due to Lewy body or mixed dementias or vascular dementia. This purple block is due to Alzheimer's disease. I have here these two gentlemen. Avi Senna first wrote about dementia in the 10th century, a thousand years before Alzheimer did. Alzheimer described his first patient in 1906. We've had this problem for an incredibly long time. The name of my com company comes from Avi Senna, Senna from there. Age is a risk factor. One in 10 people over the age of 65 comes down with Alzheimer's disease. One in two if you live to be 90. 
And you know, with, in, with improved healthcare and nutrition, we're all living so much longer, we can all expect to live to be about 85 to 90, which means half the people in this room are going to come down with Alzheimer's. That's how serious a problem it is. This slide here shows the rise in people over the age of 65 from the 1900s in this country. So that by the year 2050, we're going to have a full 80 million people in this country that are over the age of 65. And about half of them will be over the age of 85. If you think that's bad, look what happens in the rest of the world. So the areas in blue are the areas of the, of the world today where the population makes up more than 20%. Population over the age of 65 makes up more than 20%. This is what's going to, uh, what our world's going to look like in the year 2050. So we have a tsunami that's coming our way. We have a huge societal problem. This disease is dreadful. So the Alzheimer's market, needless to say, is huge. Um, there are five million people in this country that suffer from Alzheimer's disease today. Uh, and the, the market is forecast to increase to 13.5 million by 2050. And patients live eight to 10 years post-diagnosis. And the annual co cost of care in US alone is $200 billion a year. And it's expected to increase by 19% every year. Any new drug that just delays the onset, doesn't even cure it, just delays the onset by five years would yield a societal benefit of $4 trillion a year. And there is no cure for the disease. So currently, we have only two FDA-approved drugs. And these are uh, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors or uh, NMDA receptor antagonists. What, are the, what they do is they just provide mild symptomatic relief for a very short time. They do nothing to stop the progression of the disease. And there are no existing technologies under development right now that have been shown to delay disease progression or provide significant patient benefit. So what we have right now is if you have patients that are not taking any drugs, then, then they would decline as shown in this, uh, this line. And if they take something like Aricept, then there is a, a, mild, a, a moderate benefit for about six months, and then they go down the same way. So what's Senna doing about it? Well, we're developing uh, disease-modifying drugs for Alzheimer's uh, using a novel mechanism that was developed but in, in our lab in, at UCSD. Um, what this mechanism does is to inhibit the production of A-beta, beta amyloid or A-beta. A-beta is, is a major toxic product and is responsible for Alzheimer's disease, and it's the primary component of plaques, and you'll hear a lot more about A-beta as we move forward. Let me tell you, let me talk a little bit about Alzheimer's disease. What happens there? Well, the morphological changes in the brain include uh, cortical atrophy, loss of neurons, dysfunction and loss of synapses, and the presence of two inclusions in the brain, neurofibrillary tangles and neurotic plaques. Let me go through and explain all of those. So, and this is what a slice of a normal brain would look like. The cerebral cortex is this brown ribbon here. And you can see it's nice and wide. Uh, this is the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex. These are the regions that are responsible for memory. And these are the regions that go first in Alzheimer's disease, which is the reason why you have all these memory problems. Well, this is what an Alzheimer's brain would look like. And you can see this extreme shrinkage of the cerebral cortex, and of course, the hippocampus is gone. 
and then you have these severely enlarged ventricles. Over here in this cartoon, what you're showing, what we're showing is that this is what a normal brain would look like. These are neurons, healthy neurons. In Alzheimer's disease, what you would find is that the neurons are filled inside the neurofibrillary tangles, and outside there are these amyloid deposits. And this is what it would look like. This is what a real this is a slide of a real cell. This is a really diseased Alzheimer's neuron, which is full of tangles, compared to this beautiful, healthy neuron. And this is a deposit of plaque. Not a pretty picture. And of course, I said there's a loss of synapses. What are synapses? They're just connections. Their synapse is formed when two cells talk to each other, and there is, there is a transmission of electrical signals and chemicals between the cells so they can communicate. And what happens in Alzheimer's disease is the synapse. So this is one cell, this is another cell. The synapse is broken. And so this is the reason why there isn't a flow of information. And of course, I told you about plaques and tangles. So what I have here, this is a silver-stained uh, slide of um, a piece of amygdala from a patient with, so it's part of the brain from a patient with uh, a six-year-old history, six-year history of progressive dementia. In the middle here is a large plaque. And the neurons, you can see, are full of tangles uh, compared to a normal neuron, which would be golden, like this. Not seen in this kind of preparation is the cell loss, which is such an important feature of the disease. This slide, uh, these two, two pictures are original slides from George Glenner. Uh, and I will be talking about him later. He's the man that first described the uh, A-beta. He looked. So George Glenner was a professor at UCSD when I first started working on Alzheimer's disease. He, he had just arrived from the NIH, and the man that hired me had just hired him. Uh, and George Glenner's mother-in-law had Alzheimer's, or dementia. And he was trying to figure out what was going on. And he'd worked on amyloidosis, different types of amyloidosis, all his life. So when he looked under the microscope, and he saw this structure, this classic birefringent Maltese cross after uh, staining with Congo red, he recognized it. And this is why he named it beta amyloid. So um, beta amyloid, when you look under the microscope, looks like that or it is found coating vessel walls. A tangle would look like that under the microscope. And interestingly, these tangles were drawn, drawn in 1908 by Bonfiglio. I thought it would be interesting to see how good those drawings were. All right, now I want to talk to you about beta amyloid and why it is so important and why we are focusing on that. This is George Glenner. You just heard me talk about him. Um, so the amyloid hypothesis states that beta amyloid gets deposited in the brain a good 30 years, 20 to 30 years, before you get dementia. And as a result, along the way, you get other things happening downstream. You would get microglial activation, which would lead to inflammation. And you know there are certain people that are working on inflammation uh, therapies for the brain. Uh, that leads later on to the formation of, uh, formation of tangles. And then after, after about 20 years, you get neuronal loss. And then you get frank dementia. So I've got this because I want to show you what this is. I don't know whether you can see it. These are little, these are clocks that are drawn by Alzheimer's patients. Because time is so abstract, for some reason, if you get an Alzheimer's patient to draw a clock, they don't get it right. They just can't tell. 
And, and this is one of the tests that's actually being used right now in, in the diagnosis of, of Alzheimer's. There are two major forms of A-beta, or beta amyloid, um, A-beta 40 and A-beta 42. I'll be mentioning those. What it means is these are peptides that are 40 or 42 amino acids long. Okay, and the longer form is the more toxic form because the, other, the, the two additional amino acids are really hydrophobic. Technical, um, it's okay, uh, just remember there are two forms, okay? All right, so there have been, when you, this, this slide shows you that it's really important to treat the disease as early as possible. Because if you, the idea is if you treat it, if you stop the deposition of beta amyloid, then hopefully you will stop all the other downstream events, including dementia. And that's where, we, where we're working on this, okay? Um, there have been a lot of studies, a lot of clinical trials that have failed. As you know, we've had nothing but bad news, right, with Alzheimer's. Well, part of the reason is that these trials have taken uh, place, uh, or, or the people that are being used for the trials, are too far gone. There is no point of doing clinical trials on someone who's at this stage of, of Alzheimer's, because you're never going to bring back those cells that are dead, that are, that are lost. You really want to get in there as early as possible. And so the optimal clinical stage of disease modification is early in the course of the disease when neuronal injury is low. And this is typically what happens. This, it, it start the, the A beta, the plaques and tangles get deposited in the brain, and then there is a progression that's predictable through the brain, and you don't want to get anywhere here. You, you don't even want to go there. You want to go before anything is deposited. So what are the current efforts in the field? So the, there are two types of therapies that people are working on. One type, they're the beta and the gamma secretase inhibitors or modulators, and I will talk about that and I'll explain to you what they are. Or there are monoclonal antibodies. And there are problems with both. Uh, as you know, there haven't been any success stories. We have a novel and different approach. Our technology is not our, uh, a monoclonal antibody or an inhibitor or modulator of the beta and gamma secretases. Our drug candidates are small peptides of PS1, and I'll, I'll explain to you what that is which is a component of the gamma secretase complex. Okay, so it's one of the proteins that's involved in this complex. And it's a small fragment of that that binds APP and blocks its processing to A beta. And what do I mean by all of that? So I have a nice picture to show you. So what we have here is the amyloid precursor protein. This is the precursor. This is the large protein from which the A beta is cleaved. The A beta is the red box. This is a special type of protein. It's a membrane protein. The blue box here is a membrane. So it sits inside the membrane, shoots out of the cell. And what you have, in order to release A beta from its precursor, you need the action of two enzymes that work like scissors, molecular scissors, okay? The beta secretase at its amino terminus and the gamma secretase. And what all these other efforts, when I talked about the beta or gamma secretase inhibitors or modulators, what they are trying to do is they're trying to inhibit the activity of these enzymes so that these enzymes can no longer cut. And, and they've been remarkably successful at stopping the production of A-beta by this means. The problem 
is that you know nature is very economic. It's it doesn't it's too expensive for nature to have one enzyme for one protein. What it does is it makes one enzyme that'll cut many similar proteins. Well, these enzymes have not one or two, but more like 50 to 100 different substrates that they function on. So you can imagine that whereas you would be really successful in reducing the production of A beta, or inhibiting the production of A beta, you're also inhibiting 50 to 100, 90 at last count actually, different reactions in the cell. So you're going to have so many of target effects. And some of those reactions are incredibly important for the cell's housekeeping. So if they're inhibited, the cell gets very sick and you have a lot of problems. So the gamma secretase is almost, nobody's working on it, almost, gamma secretase inhibitors because the, the um, side effects are so bad, the off-target effects, and there's so many really important reactions that are inhibited. The beta secretase inhibitors, people are still working on because they're not as toxic Inhibiting it has not produced as many severe side effects as the gamma secretase. But I will put to you this. Any, any re, uh, cell or any enzyme that is inhibited for 20 to 25 years, because that's how long you're going to take an Alzheimer's drug. So inhibiting it beta secretase, for instance, may not produce really uh, bad effects in a year or two, but you can't inhibit. As a scientist, as a cell biologist, I refuse to believe that you can inhibit 50 to 100 reactions in a cell for 25 years and not suffer some consequences. So Sina, has a different approach. What we have is we have peptides that are derived from one of the components of the gamma secretase complex, pristinilin 1. That's a protein. And what these peptides do is they bind to APP here, away from the cleavage sites. But that binding is enough to stop the processing. of uh, APP to A beta. So that just screws it up. But what's good about it is this reaction is incredibly specific. It affects only one reaction in the cell, that one. So all the other reactions that are catalyzed by beta and gamma secretases are intact, no problems. So um, when I was preparing this talk, uh, David asked me to, to give a little bit of history. How did I arrive here? So I, I'm going to give just a brief history. Um, this is John Singer. He is my partner that I told you uh, that, that passed away last year. Way back in 1996, we had uh, published a hypothesis in science, and that was right after uh, the presilinins were discovered. So I told you the beta ABP is a, is a membrane protein. Well, so are the presinolins, but the presinolins go through the membrane multiple times. At that time, we thought seven times. Now, then it went to six, and then people said it was eight. Now, they think it's nine. Nonetheless, they go through the membrane several times, okay? But when the presinolins were discovered, um, John and I uh, sat down and, and talked about this, and it is quite clear that, you know, A beta is, uh, is a part of APP. So if there was a mutation in that gene, you could understand how somebody could get Alzheimer's. But these presinolins are in different chromosomes, in completely different, different proteins, and, and in these families, people found 
mutations. So it was quite clear that somehow these had to be interacting in some way so that whether you had a mutation in beta MPP or PS, you still got the same pathology. Okay, this is before anybody knew anything about either beta MPP or PS. This is 96. And we, uh, based on some precedents in nature, uh, we came up with this hypothesis where what we were suggesting was that APP on the surface of one cell was interacting with presenilin on the surface of another cell, which is in green, and by, by, via their, these domains, they're outside, so outside the cell. So these guys were talking to each other. They were interacting with each other. Um, we still don't know whether that's the way it happens. But what that did was it led us to look at this region, this amino terminal region of PS. And in experiments that came, this was 96. Uh, in 2006, no, 10 years later, we were able to show that if we engineered cells so that they only produced, only expressed presenilin but not APP, and APP but not presenilin, and you interacted them, then you got the production of A-beta. But if you threw in that fragment, that little piece of PS that was sticking out into the culture, then it went away. And so while everyone was still worrying about what was inside, what was outside, whether it's six, seven, eight, nine uh, domain, transmembrane domains, we said, well, you know, this has some therapeutic potential. It doesn't matter whether it's cell-cell, whether it's all in the same cell, whether what matters is this fragment is reducing A-beta. Let's chase it further. And so, so now this is 2015, this was published. Uh, we made large fragments of that whole N-terminal domain of PS. And we found that some of them, uh, one of them reduced A-beta substantially in cultured cells, and others didn't. And we, we took this, and then we made smaller and smaller overlapping fragments. And we found that some of them reduced A-beta. There's a whole family of proteins that reduced peptides, reduced A-beta substantially, and some didn't. And this is tissue culture. When we did the same experiment, when we gave animals and these are transgenic animals. These are mice that have been engineered to produce the human A-beta. If we gave these mice all of these peptides, different peptides, for two weeks, and then looked at their brains, we found exact same thing happening. Those peptides that gave a decrease in A-beta in vitro also did so in these mice. And there were some that were better than others. And so our lead peptide is P8, which gives, which can reduce A beta by 50 to 70%. And this is what's really neat. So this is an uh, um, immunohistochemistry. This is a brain slice from one of these mice, from these mice that were treated with the peptides and stained with the antibody. And what you see is this box shows um, uh, mice that were, treat, that were treated just with PBS, just a vehicle, not with a peptide, not with a drug. And you can see large deposits of A-beta. But those mice that were treated with A-beta reduced, uh, treated with the, with the P4, P8, with the peptides, reduced A-beta substantially in two weeks. So we were really uh, excited, and so we are now, oh, before I get there, what's the best thing is that we selected mice that uh, gave us over a 50% reduction in A-beta. So here, this is, uh, this is a group of six mice. If they were not treated by the peptides, they get, gave this huge amount of A-beta, they showed large amounts of A-beta, 
if you treated them with either P4 or the arbespeptide P8, you saw this reduction in A beta. In these same mice, we then measured the activity of the beta or the gamma sequitase, and it's unchanged, as is the level of APP. So these are spectacularly specific, and they leave the activities of the enzymes untouched while reducing A beta. Okay, so we've shown A beta reduction in vitro. We've shown A beta reduction in transgenic mice. But we wanted to take a look at what happens in humans. And the, what we did was we are um, actually in a sister company now. Uh, we've just founded uh, Cognistem where we're looking at this. But what we did was, we, oh, first thing I want to, want to um, tell you that Alzheimer's disease is not one disease. It's very heterogeneous. It's, you, you, I, I've talked a little bit about the genetic form. And there you can have a mutation in the APP gene or the presinolin gene. And then you have the late onset sporadic forms where you just, there's such, either you don't know why people get that or there are certain factors like APOE4 uh, that, that give you a propensity. It's not the genetic form, it just puts you at a higher risk for Alzheimer's. All of them have the same A beta accumulating in the brain, though. So we wanted to see whether our compound would be equally good for all the different forms of Alzheimer's. Because, you know, right now, nobody's thinking about this. When people make drugs, they just give the same drug in the same dose to everybody. And everybody's different. All the diseases are different. They may be all be Alzheimer's, but it depends on whether it's a mutation, which mutation it is. You know, it depends whether it's sporadic form, how long you've had the disease, when was the age of onset, how fast the disease is progressing. But we've decided to study this in stem cells from patients. So what we do is we take um, fibroblasts from these different patients and we reprogram them to become induce pluripotent stem cells, and then we differentiate them so that we now have neurons. So we essentially have the brain in a dish. And these different um, neurons, IPS-derived neurons, represent the differences in the diseases in the disease, in different patients. And what, we wanted, what, what we're getting at now, what we're trying to do eventually, is to have a platform for personalized diagnosis in, in medicine, where we can maybe, you know, when, because also, eventually, I think we will ha still have to start thinking about combination therapy. This is great, our drug can reduce A-beta, but you know, in certain forms, maybe you'd want to try a combination, where you can do that in a dish. First, so we did this, we made these neurons and we tested our drug in these neurons. And sure enough, so what we have here is different doses um, of the drug, of our PA that was given. These are just representative curves. One's a familial Alzheimer's disease, one's sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that at the right dose, you get a reduction in A beta with our P8 compound, which is really exciting. So this is the closest thing you can get outside the patient. That is the patient, really. Let's get back to P8. So our Senna's peptides are uh, two best ones, uh, are eight amino acids and 15 amino acids. The eight amino acids is the one that we're chasing right now. Uh, they can inhibit A beta in vitro by 50 to 100 percent, uh, and in a transgenic mouse model by 40 to 60 percent, and also um, in patient derived stem cells now. Uh, it's a novel approach that does not target the beta or the gamma sequitase. That is really what's very, very important. 
Okay, now any drug that you are trying to make for Alzheimer's disease or for any brain disorder needs to get to the brain. And that is the greatest challenge because nature, again, is nature protects us by, by forming a blood brain barrier. So a normal blood vessel would look like this, and it has these little pores um, where things can get in and out. So this would be the blood vessel, this would be the brain. And you can see things getting, in, oh, this would be outside. You can get, see things getting outside the blood into the surrounding tissue. In the brain, however, the blood vessels have these really tight junctions. So nothing can go in and out because the brain doesn't want things like all sorts of nasty viruses and all sorts of things getting into your brain, right? So it's done it that way. Well, if you're gonna make a drug, you're gonna to have to deliver the drug from the blood to the brain, and if it doesn't get through, it's not gonna be very good. Um, but certain small, there is a size limit, and a charge, and certain small compounds can get to the brain. Uh, and I am happy to say that our P8 does get from the blood to the brain. And I'll show you the data later. I just want to say a little bit about this. I hope this is what a healthy um, blood vessel looks like. But when, when the, in the brain, but when the blood brain barrier is compromised, it looks like this. Okay, there's all these holes here. And I just wanted to mention this because in Alzheimer's disease, the blood-brain barrier is compromised. And that is the only reason these monoclonal antibodies that everybody is working on get to the brain. Because they, you know, it's a small number of them can get through this compromised blood-brain barrier. And that is also the reason why they're not going to make, I don't think, very effective drugs, because you need enough antibodies to get to the brain to do the job, and you need to go really early. So if you go really early, your blood-brain barrier is not going to get that, be that compromised. And also, you need, for, for the antibodies to work on something, you need a deposition, a beta deposition there. And that's almost too late. So our, our technology is useful because it's taken care of the problems, first of all, with the beta and gamma secretases, but also it's, it's very, very early. You can give it before the start of, of the A beta formation, You're stopping the formation. Okay, so what this is is just data, which um, I'll just gloss over, to show that regardless of whether you give it, uh, regardless of the route of administration, whether it's intranasal or intravenous or subcutaneous, you're getting large amounts of, of the peptide, a P8, in the, in the blood and in the cerebral spinal fluid which is a mark that it gets to the brain, okay? And our, uh, well, we, uh, our method of choice for administration is subcutaneous because it's a simple injection. Okay, so to summarize, then Senna's uh, approach is different, specific, interferes only with the reaction that produces A beta. Um, the best candidate, can be delivered to the brain in rats by various routes, and subcutaneous administration is the favored mode of delivery for P8. Um, Senna's patent portfolio, uh, we have six issued US patents, seven uh, international patents. Um, Cura has another two that we've, we've just filed uh, for the small molecules. And all IP is exclusively owned by Senna or licensed to Senna by UC San Diego. A management and support team. Um, I am uh, the founder, president, CEO. Uh, 
Mike Krupp, who's in the audience, is our corporate and licensing advisor. Ruprecht, who's also in the audience, is our business development advisor. And then Carrie Miller has been a patent attorney from day one. And uh, John Campbell is our corporate attorney. Um, and we have a really uh, impressive uh, scientific and drug development advisors. Uh, Howard Feldman is the dean of Alzheimer's uh, research at, at Alzheimer's Center at UCSD. And we have a lot of other people that are real experts at, in the drug development uh, process. So uh, our, our plan, our development plan, we, our lead is ready for R&D. It'll take us uh, a year to complete all the safety and toxicology studies, less than a year, because we've started. Another year to uh, finish phase one clinical trials, another two years to do phase two, and then we hope we can get acquired by some pharmaceutical company. So the summary of transformational impact of Senna's technology, there is no disease-modifying drug currently available. Senna's candidates are disease-modifying. Uh, it's a novel technology that is early, very important, and addresses previous failures by others in the field. Uh, and what we, we aim to do is to slow down or stop the progression of the disease in patients diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment. So it's designed to stop the disease in its tracks, whatever stage the disease is, is at. Um, and uh, greatly slow or arrest the onset of a disease in those people who are at risk, such as family members of Alzheimer's disease patients. Uh, and eventually, this is where the promise is, eventually to develop this drug for use by everyone over the age of 65, just the same way as the statins are being used for our disease, so that we stop. We, st we can stop. If this works, we really can stop Alzheimer's disease in a generation, if everybody over the age of 65 takes it, and just stops the production of A-beta. Wouldn't that be something? So I want to leave you with two slides. One is the timeline of Alzheimer's. As I said, Avicenna first wrote about dementia in uh, 1037 AD. Um, there have been all of these, some of these things I've, I've, I have uh, talked to you about that have happened along the way. But the last approved drug for Alzheimer's, not disease modifying, just symptomatic. The last approved drug in this country was in 2006. Of course, there's been a flurry of activity since, but nothing has worked. 2006 was when we founded our company and we started working on this. And if we're here now, this is our next key milestone. We hope to be in humans next year. We're seeking $5 million to take us from here to the end of phase one. And we've been funded up until now entirely by the NIH and other grants. Thank you for your attention. Do you need modification in the, in the mice? So we haven't done behavior studies. We haven't done behavior studies because, not because we don't, we'd like to do them. Um, behavior in mice tells us very little, actually. Behavior in mice is not the same as behavior in humans. However, it's, it's still useful to do. But you know, when you're working with NIH funding, you're pretty, you keep your nose to the ground and you do what is required for the FDA. And so, you know, if we get some additional money that we can use, um, we'd love to do that. Um, looks like great progress, but uh, I'll just be interested in your thoughts as to maybe why you're not seeing a more binary result. Um, so you're seeing like 20, 30, maybe 90% changes. Um, 
I suppose we've been spoiled by the polio vaccine and smallpox vaccines to kind of like a one shot um, cure. Um, does it suggest that maybe you're not focused on the cornerstone or what's, what's your thoughts as to... Not focused on the what? Cornerstone. Oh. The, the um, cause. This is not a vaccine. That's number one. It's not a vaccine, right? Well, all it's doing is it's st stopping the production. So the models that we're using are models that produce huge amounts of A beta. And we're, we're reducing um, the production. So, and this is what I, what I meant when I said, uh, you know, the, these uh, stem cells that we have patient-derived stem cells. Those, are, those studies are going to tell us a lot about amounts of A-beta produced by different patients, because it's different, and when and how much to use. Right now, we have over-expressing systems, and we are sticking our peptide in, and we're seeing a 50 to 70% reduction. But you can fine-tune it some more, and we'll have to. Hey, thank you for giving the presentation tonight. So I have a question about money, money and time. So you mentioned most of your funding was from NIH, 16 million so far. And you founded the company in 2006. So that's about 18 years, with no revenue or product yet. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm thinking in my, like, not if I was in investor's shoes and I'm wondering, okay, what have you demonstrated? You've demonstrated ability to specifically bind to the precursor protein, ability to get to the brain. But even though you have a 70 perhaps 70% reduction in the concentration of A-beta, a um, what does that mean regarding solving the problem of Alzheimer? How nonlinear is the relationship between contracting the Alzheimer and A-beta reduction? You could still get Alzheimer within a few years or maybe in the same time frame, even with the lower A beta reduction. Is that link been proved yet? No, that's not true has, at all. Has that, has that's, that link that's been not, proved? That's not true at all. <clears throat> A beta, so first of all, let me, let me ask you the first, answer the first. We founded our company in 2006. You may not remember, but 2008, we had a financial crisis in this country. Nobody was investing. Thank goodness for the NIH, because none of this work would have got done otherwise. And people are only just starting to invest. So, and, and, you, I think there are some VCs in this, in this room. Go talk to them. If you're starting out, they'll say, oh, you're very interesting, but very early. Nobody wants to know at that stage. You have to bring it to a point where people want you to de-risk de it somehow. Exactly. And That's that my takes, question. Is there too much risk right now? That takes time. Yep. That takes time. Exactly. So then the second half of my question is, why did you move to a company so earlier? Most of your funding is from NIH. Couldn't you have made similar progress because in academia? What was the reason? Have you gotten some, some value by founding a company that you couldn't have gotten being an academic researcher so far? So first of all, I'm still an academic researcher. I do research at the company, but it's no different from what I ever did at the, at the university. But IP becomes the issue. If you have, are at the university, everything you do in, at the university belongs to the university. And it's very expensive. So if you're, going to, if you're going to develop a drug, you're best suited to do it outside the university. A strange coincidence that I saw the news today that there was somebody, who's a, a news blip that I saw, they said, oh, the studies have shown who knows where, that alcohol contributes to Alzheimer's. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you, what are the different things that contribute? I'm getting older. I kind of want to make sure I avoid things that are going to accelerate. Actually, you know what? Up until now, everyone's saying a glass of red wine is really good for you. <laughs> Whatever is good for the heart is good for the brain. And, and moderate amounts of, uh, of alcohol are actually supposed to be good for you for Alzheimer's. And they, they get this, these data from uh, people in the Mediterranean. So the Medi Mediterranean diet is supposed to be really good for you for Alzheimer's. So again, as I said, everything that's good for the heart is good for the brain. And 
with the Mediterranean diet, they, have, they always have small amounts of alcohol, of wine. Can you tell us a little about your plans for phase two? How are you going to do, how are you going to do your phase two clinicals? Phase two. Um, so we're, I'm, I've actually, I'm, I've started talking to uh, both uh, UCSD and uh, Paul Eisen, who's over at USC. And you know what, the, the NIH has funded um, a consortium. I'm, I'm interested more in the technical aspects because you've got 10 years of onset of this disease, you've got no good markers. No. I mean, how are you going to, how are you going to okay. prove, I'll, I'll how are you going to prove efficacy? Okay. So biomarkers, biomarkers. So right now, and, and again, going back to the consortium, there are all these uh, Alzheimer's centers now that are collecting patients that are pre-MCI or pre-mild cognitive impairment. They're really, There's really a really good marker for Early, that? really early. Yes, there is. There is a very good PET imaging technique. Oh. And that can detect the tiniest amounts of A beta in the brain. So what they're doing is they're following these patients through. And any, any uh, so even in our phase 1B trial, we're planning on doing PET imaging. And we're pl planning on looking at biomarkers, the silk. Uh, we're, we're trying to, we're going to be looking at A beta levels in the cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. So, so what you're going to show, I mean, it's going to, the, the disease takes 10 years onset. The disease takes, actually, Even more. the I disease mean. takes, it's, it's, it's a good 30 years between, before, so you the, know, between so point, dementia and the onset of the disease. It's a long-term process. But, so, so, so this can you prove efficacy just from the uh, the, the the the? Yeah. So so uh, this is this is a this is a problem. The amylins are reduced, but you're not going to prove that dementia right. has right. is has been reduced. And and I you know I don't know uh, how we're going to do that, but <laughs> if you if you can reduce a beta, then the chances of it's going to be a really you're long. The expert. Yeah, you're the expert. Has a, there, as far as I know, there hasn't been a one-to-one -one causal. Uh, actually, <laughs> the the studies. So with, uh, with I'm talking about causality, not not coincidence. I'm talking about causality. Yes, there has there have been studies where, if a beta in animals, if a beta is inhibited, you don't get the other downstream effects. Now. Uh, this disease is a, is a difficult one. It takes, it takes forever. And I think with the clinical trials, and, and the FDA is scratching its head right now as well, because clearly you can't do a 30-year clinical trial. You have to come up. You have to be able to say at some point that this is working or not. And biomarkers are the, are the way to do it. We can measure biomarkers very effectively. Is, is there a good diagnostic for this disease? I mean, a biological diagnostic? Yeah, biomarkers. Yeah. Yes. So, so <clears throat> I guess practically, because I had to run these big studies, is um, are you you're going to give the person the drug subcutaneous once a day, or are you going to put it in a depot form so it, it dissolves for a month? And so I th what we're planning on doing initially is just to give straight injections subcutaneous injections, but, but, uh, and maybe once a day, or once a week, or some, whatever, we're, we're doing all the studies to find out the frequency. But if, it, if we know that it gets from the blood to the brain, uh, we can think of all sorts of nifty little tricks of getting, getting the peptide in, in via the blood. So there's, there's things like patches, there's nanoneedles. Uh, there's all sorts of new uh, techniques for delivery that are coming up. But that won't be right now. That'll be later on. And I guess just a word of caution in that, you know, the phase one is just looking at the toxicity. The, yeah, the phase one is just safety. Phase two is going to be horrendously expensive. Even the PET scans are not that sensitive or specific. So you have to enroll large groups of patients got to follow them for six or 12 months in order to prove that, mm -hmm. um, well, now you can, it's, they've gotten better. But 
but you know, there's a dilution factor. If you put 100 people into a study, everybody knows that maybe only 80% have Alzheimer's. So from a statistical point of view, you've got to have a lot of people in there because of this dilution factor. And then you're, you're going to have to study them for 6 to 12 months. Yeah. Okay. All right. right. I just want you, I hope you're prepared Right. Listen, I've been the, studying it for 30 years. Right. 6 to 12 months, ah, big deal. But, but, but there are patient groups. There are patient groups such as, for instance, these, these people in Colombia where there's a whole community of, of people with this, with this gene mutation. Right. There are 5,000 patients there sitting, waiting. Okay. And, and there are several Alzheimer's drugs that are being uh, tried on that population as well. But all of the, um, all of, so that's just one. It's, it's not such a, there are patients available. All of these consortium, when I started to talk about the consortium, these consortiums have their own patients. And that's what we would do. There are clinical trials taking place all the time. And yes, they all take long. But what, are you not going to do them because they take long? Or they're expensive? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Oh, more. Oh, phase two is 200 million. Yeah. OK, I have, I have a question over here. Okay. Um, so as someone that, that has family history and carries a genetic disposition, I guess I'm curious if at this point um, you have any idea what potential side effects, like as you go through the clinical, the first phase of the clinical trial, do you have any predictions or indications based on the rat? The, the, the toxicology studies are taking place right now. Okay. So I'll be able to tell you that at the end of this, you know, probably in a few months' time. Okay. So you can't so share far, anything. Nobody at this point. has died. Okay. All the mice. That's encouraging. <laughs> all the mice and all the rats, they're doing just fine. So, so I'm hoping. I think you're hiding something. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say you were starting the human testing at age 65? No. What I'm saying is it would be really great if once this drug is approved and we know that it's, it's working for everybody of the age of 65 to take it, because then that would just stop the disease in its I tracks. understand. But I mean, your clinical trials, I uh, thought you said somebody, people, patients would have to be yeah. 65 um, and over. We don't know what, what the age is, age is going to be for these tests. Um, these clinical trials are, right now, we're just working on the details of them. The phase one and the phase two. I just wonder whether 65 is too late considering the early onset yeah. of the whole process. I think it'll, it'll be patients that, ha that are in the group that, well, the, you know, the earliest. And there, are, there is a really early cohort, so uh, I don't know what ages they will be. But it's, it's the earliest uh, um, in, in, in the... Uh, disease progression. Um, although a lot of uh, the current uh, beta secret A studies do suggest that by the time you go to, um, even, even if it's a, it's a patient with early sta stage Alzheimer's, so long as they, when they're older, much older, there are other things, other diseases that come into play. And so, you know, a lot of them have vascular dementia, a lot of them have other things wrong with them, and those would interfere with uh, the, you know, the interpretation. So it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I, you know, we don't know yet what are the age groups going to be. Yeah. Where are you expecting or where are you looking for the $5 million, and how will you use it next? Is it to set up the phase two? Uh, no, that's going to be phase one. Be Five phase million one. for phase one. Five million for phase yes, yeah. yes. It's, it's a small study. Oh, um, uh, we are looking at, well, we're just starting to talk to uh, VCs, uh, you know, private investors, uh, angels. Okay. Yeah. It, would it be worth exploring other countries for a faster version of a phase two study that would prove something? Um, so, I, I right now I'm focusing on phase one, but yes, there are uh, 
a lot of people are approaching me from Australia, from China, from, you know, uh, I think we will do what's best for us when the time comes. Yeah, depending on what the FDA wants. Right. You know, I, I'm, I, one of the things I don't want to do is go to places like Australia because people, they say, oh, you don't need the FDA. Well, I want the FDA because I want to make sure that everything we do, we do it correctly. Well, thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>